Robert Edoff was one of the first cattle producers we met when we began this journey of homegrown. Today, we caught up with Scott to talk about his life, his cattle, and his family. Where do you even begin? Yeah, that's, that's the big thing is where do you begin? Uh, I would guess I would begin with, with my family history of, of my great grandpa coming over here in, in about 1888, they were here. I don't know which, it, it just said in the history book that in 1888, all of the Bale children were here and that consisted of about seven kids. <laughs> and they came at different times. They came in, in about two year intervals. And the oldest came and then when they've got settled with friends and family, then they sent for the next two and the next two and the next two. Wow. So in 1888, they were all here. And they came from where? England, Norfolk, England. England. Oh, yeah. okay. The, their folks had a linen mill that they made linens for the Queen of England. Uh, my mother has a, a tablecloth which has, in, it's, it's woven right into the fabric made for the Queen of England by the Bale min, linen mill. And my sister has that. Wow. And so that goes back a long ways. I think it's 24 miles to Scenic, 30 miles to New Underwood, and about 27 miles to Hermosa. Hmm. So right if, in the if, you, if you've ever been in the middle of nowhere, we don't live in the middle of nowhere, but we can see it from here. <laughs> I'm sure it has oh, its I charm. Just, yeah, I just love the solitude. You know, people aren't bothering you all the time. You don't hear the, the traffic, the, you know, I have trouble if we go somewhere in a hotel, all the traffic, all the little noises, mm -hmm. you know, I have trouble sleeping. It's always something that's, but here, there's no, there's barely airplane noises. Right. We can't see any lights from here at night unless we go up on top of the hill, then we can see lights. Well, it's home, that's the big thing. You know, and it doesn't get any better than that. Wherever you hang your hat, wherever you call home, that home is, is really where it's at. Right, in of my course. Mind. Tell us a little bit about your wife. Where is she from? <laughs> How did you meet? <laughs> well, I don't know how to start this conversation. <laughs> uh, in, in 1983, uh, I was living in New Underwood at the time. I went to work for, for Dick Aldrin, and at the time, Veronica's brother worked for him. And so I got to know him, you know, pretty good, chummed around with him a little bit and went to dances and stuff. Well, we got to a dance in Hermosa, and her brother Joe had this gal that he wanted to go out with, well, she kept saying, well, Veronica was Joe's girlfriend, and he kept saying, she is not, she is not. Well, then he talked me into taking her home, and that's <laughs> kind of where that, <laughs> that all started. So let's talk about your four children. Where are they at right now? Oh, Rachel is just up the creek here. Uh, Rachel married David Urig. He's the manager for Mount Rushmore Angus. Mm -hmm. And they have two lovely little kids, little Henri, little beasts. <laughs> anyway, they're the they're the light of our life. Anyway, and and then Kyle is down uh, at Kyle, South Dakota. He's working for a guy down there training horses, and he's got some cows down there and stuff. And Georgia is in uh, Crawford, Nebraska. Her and her husband, uh, Trevor, and they've got a few cows down there. And Georgia works for a bank down there. Uh, credit union and uh, Trevor, he's, he has some cows and works for the neighbor ranch job. But <laughs> Olivia, the youngest, the overachiever, <laughs> she goes to law school. She's in her, gonna finish up her second year of law school. <laughs> and uh, she's in Lincoln, Nebraska. Wow, kind of all over the place. They're kind of all over the place. <laughs> Not too far though. Not they're, too far. You know, right. they're a day's drive. Mm -hmm. So that that's pretty nice. That is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Here he comes. Here he comes. Oh boy, got a mitten, huh?
just a beautiful day in the neighborhood. That's what it is. Spreading a little sunshine. Tell me a little bit about the operation that you have set up here. We're basically a cow-calf operation. That's, that's about all we do. We're, we're uh, basically a grass farmer because that's what we do. We, we raise grass for the cows. We don't do any farming. I've had some farming done by the neighbor over the years. They've, they've put in some alfalfa and stuff for me, some hay, but other, otherwise we don't, we don't do any farming. We don't do any custom feeding. You know, basically we, we raise calves on grass. And if we do keep some yearlings, we just try to grass them. We don't try to background them or anything. Right. He wasn't born this morning when we were here. What does a day in the life of Scott look like? <laughs> there, there is no typical day. Is there no typical day? The, a typical day is non-typical. Because, you know, it's, it's just like this morning. You, uh, you get up, you go out, nothing works right because, because the windshield wipers are froze down, so you, I, I jerked the windshield wiper off the pickup trying to get the you know, the window thawed out and then you go and and uh, the feed pickup is, you didn't shut the gate on it, right? So you're scattering feed all over the place. And I mean, it, it's just, it's just, that's the way it goes. You're just putting out fires as you go. Then the next day you go and there's nothing to do. There's nothing broke down, everything works really well. So you come home, you come home early for lunch and then you go and you come home early and you're like, boy, there should be something I should be doing. <laughs> and the next night, every, everything you touch just goes south. You know, there's, there's a cow with a calf, needs assisted. You know, the tractors broke down, the feed pickup won't run. You know, the dog bites you, you know, because he's mad at you that day. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And, and you, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. A branding basically is, is a celebration. I, I've always said this. A branding is a celebration that, that you made it another year, that you're a success. It, it's, it's a festivity more than work. We, we, we call all the neighbors. They come and help us, you know, for the day. And, and a lot of people that, that we know in town that, that uh, hunt here, you know, do all kinds of stuff with us. They'll come out and they'll help us for the day. And we, we usually brand about four to 500 calves in a day. Wow. And, and do that many cows, run those, run cows down the chute and, and work them too. But what it basically is, is you have to, you have to get the cattle in and you have to work them. You have to give them their branded time shot. You know, there's castration, dehorning, you know, all kinds of stuff to get, to get them ready to go for that fall when you, when you sell them, when you market them. Otherwise, they would all be bull calves, and they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, marble and grade as well. And so then you put your permanent mark on them, your your brand that that the heifers will have all their life, you know, and they'll come back into the ranch. So you need to put a permanent mark on them. Right. And and it's easier to do it in the spring when they're littler than to wait till they're five, six hundred pounds or a thousand <laughs> pounds when it takes a lot to handle one. Of course.
you know, it sounds like with everything that you talk about, it's kind of that concept of it takes a village. Is mm -hmm. There's so many people mm -hmm. that are involved in making this happen. So can you kind of speak a little bit to that? Well, one of the, one of the neat things I like about branding is, is every year, uh, it's just like our grandson Henry running around here today. Every year they get a little older and they're a little bolder about what they're doing. They want to do this. And so our granddaughter, we always pay our help, you know, give them a little money to, to you know, to do something. And they, and it, it, they enjoy it and, and it makes them come back. But our granddaughter, she comes up to me and she goes, Grandpa, if I help Olivia sit on a calf, do I get paid? And I said, you can, I'll pay you $5 for five calves. You hmm. got to help Olivia sit on them. So she comes roaring right back, and after the five calves, she goes, Grandpa, if I do five more calves, can I get five more dollars? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's great to see them, you know, the, the village. It's great to see the kids as they're growing up because then they're roping, then they're riding a, a young horse, and they're doing this and they're doing that. Then they, they, they have a girlfriend and then they bring their families back after a while too. So you, you get to watch them grow up, you know, the, the, the kids in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and get to watch them experience all that stuff. So we've had lots of conversations about either different misconceptions that people have of farming and ranching and the agriculture world. Um, and also with rural living, you know, there's there's a lot of it's a different lifestyle um, that if you don't live in it, sometimes it's hard to understand. So, you know, mm -hmm. what are some of the top things that you wish people that don't live in rural America um, better understood? Well, I, I one of mine, I guess, is everybody. Everybody thinks you're a rich rancher. You know, we when we started out. We moved down here in this house and, and, and our belongings we brought with us was in a car and a pickup. That's all we had. I mean, we were, we were dirt poor. We made, uh, we made about $6,000 the first year we were married. I think the two of us, we both worked. And there was no way I could get into the farming and ranching. There's just no way. So what I had to do is I had to get a, a construction job to pay for the lights, the telephone, the food, you know, that's, that's how we, we made, we lived. Mm -hmm. The cows took care of the ranch. They, they made enough income to pay for all the bills on the ranch, but we couldn't afford to live off from them. So that's why we had to get a job. And Veronica took care of the cattle, basically why I worked. Wow. And a lot of times I would get a phone call in the middle of the day and she'd, if you want your damn cows fed, you're going to have to get home and fix this tractor. <laughs> This pickup quit me and I'm not <laughs> dealing with it. You need to come home and deal with it. So, I mean, there was a lot of phone calls like that. And, and our boss was really good. He understood that, you know, that she was out there. And, and if we weren't doing too much, he would, he would let me go, you know, for the afternoon or whatever to, to work on it. But, yeah, there was, there was a lot of trying times. And, and I, I, it's, I think it's just like anybody else's life. You know, when you first, when you first get married and, you know, everything is new and, you think that you're going to get rich quick and that you don't get rich quick and pretty soon you're about broke and you're trying to scramble and you know the wolf's at the door and it's you know four little kids and it's it's not easy it really mm -hmm. isn't mm -hmm. and after you get established and you kind of get into the the groove of living the way you do and and living you only get paid once a year right that is that is a huge thing <laughs> you know you have to you have to manage your money really well and uh I remember being in the bank one time, we were, we were doing an annual note and we were supposed to fill out our expenses and stuff. And so we did, Veronica and I sat down and we did it and we took it back and, and our banker said, well, there's no way in hell that anybody could live on that little bit of money. We said, well, we've been living on it for 10 years. And he's like, well, you have to ra <laughs> raise that up because <laughs> nobody can live on that. <laughs> and so that's, that's just what you do. You know, I mean, you, you do all kinds of things little odd jobs, little, you know, to get this, get that, get a horse, get a pickup, get a, you know, tires for your pickup. You just do all kinds of little jobs after work and to try to get by. And I, and I think most people are that way. I, I don't think we're really any, much different than anybody else. The, the deal is, is we have to have such a large amount of money, of assets. You know, you, you have several million dollars worth of assets. 
but you can't even afford to buy lunch today. You know, right. I mean, that's that's where it is. You can't liquidate those assets unless you pretty much liquidate everything, mm -hmm. you know, on the land part of it. So it doesn't do much good to have a huge amount of property and you can't do anything with it. Hmm. You know, you're just kind of locked on. I mean, you could sell it if you wanted to, but then there's your operation, you're going backwards. You're downsizing your operation, then your income is less. So it's, it's kind of a fine tuned game. And I think everybody's, it's like buying another house. Hmm. You know, you're trying to get enough money off that house to buy another house, a little bigger, the family and the, and the budget isn't gonna say it, but you need a new house because the kids aren't fitting in the old bedrooms and the, you know, it's just the same battle. But there, there's, you know, there is a huge financial thing there that's, you have to jump over. But. Right. So in everything that you've done and everything that you've seen and learned, do you have, what is one of your biggest takeaways that you would want the younger generation to know? That I'm a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just be patient. That's the main thing, be patient. Don't, don't think that you're gonna come out and you're, gonna, you're just gonna make a million bucks and walk away and be a millionaire by the time you're 30. This is a slow process, you know, it takes a long time. Probably been in it for 50 years, you know, I don't remember when I got my first cow, but I was probably 10. And, you know, then it's in your blood and you love to see the, the, the baby calves born. This is the greatest time of the year mm -hmm. because they're, they're being born. You know, you can see, you can see things moving. In the wintertime, after you sell calves in the fall, the cows are kind of dormant. You know, you don't see any activity, no baby calves, no no green grass. Now you see a little bit of green grass, you see baby calves. And so you're like, oh good, this is a new year. We're here comes a new year. Right. And you get excited about it. You get to see them every day, they're growing, you know, and, and you can see that you were moving ahead. Hmm. But I, I just think patience is, is a lot of it and, and not to expect that you're gonna, you know, that you're gonna really be somebody overnight. It, it takes a long time to. Right, definitely. Yeah. I think that's really good. Patience is hard. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, it's, it's something, I guess, that you learn. It's not, it's, I see young, young people and they'll be working cattle and, and they're just, you know, <laughs> you know and it's like, just relax, just relax. Cause we're not, we're not at a rodeo. This ain't a timed event. Right. We're, we're here to work cows. We have all day. Just be patient, relax. It's going to work out. The day will end well. <laughs> And so, yeah, that's my advice. I like that. That's the way they pumped water a hundred years ago. And so that's the way we still pump it. So what are some of the challenges that you face being out in this area, um, raising cattle the way that you do? What are some of those? We don't have any challenges. Everything is just, just really perfect. good. Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect world. <laughs> Two years ago, we had the wet year, and the creek. We have a we have a bridge on on both sides of us. The creek was running over the road. We could not get out of here. We, we were landlocked here for about seven days. Oh, okay, great. And I don't know what we would have did if if one of the neighbors would have had a heart attack or something. Right. They'd have to life flight us out of here. So we were stuck for seven days with a bad road water running over the road on both ends and you know it's just like well you're there mm -hmm. we couldn't get to it we couldn't get up the road to, to the fire department you know there was no way to get a fire truck to put out a house fire or any kind of a fire that that uh, we would have had mm -hmm. and so you know that's just that's just part of the the things that that goes on here you're you're the last one if if i called the sheriff right now because you were trespassing he would be an hour and a half before he came, before he got here. Because he's got priorities before he leaves. Mm -hmm. 
And if he, if you don't get a call before he gets here, you're just kind of the last on the list. Right. right. In the same way, if we wouldn't have our little fire department, we wouldn't have any emergency services. <laughs> the neighbor over here, he had uh, uh, nosebleeds. So we called Rapid City's ambulance and they was an hour and 15 minutes before they got here. Wow. And so you're just kind of out here on your own. Why do you why do you stay out here? Why do you keep doing what why you not? do? <laughs> what is it that kind of pushes you through and oh, it's, drives I, you? I think a lot of it's family history and family. You know, you're you're just tied to this ground somehow. I, I'm not sure how. Hmm. Anytime that I leave here, you know, I'm I'm so damn happy to be home that I can hardly stand myself. So it's it's got to be something in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Now that you, like you said, you've kind of seen some of the end results um, for your for your children and, and growing up, is that something that they've come to appreciate their upbringing? Oh yeah, they're they're all involved. You know, they're they're still involved, even though they're not they're not right here right now. You know, they've all got cattle here mm -hmm. or livestock or animals of some sort, and so you know they're all they're all really involved. And Kyle is probably the least involved, but he's. He's not that far off or not that far away. And so until you retire or you decide to retire, if I retired today at 60 and, and let him take it over, then what do I do? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> golf, <laughs> can you see me on the golf course? Uh, I mean, I it's, just, it's just one of those things you, you know, my dad's 86 and, and right now he's down feeding cows right now while we speak mm -hmm. because he don't know any, there's nothing else to do. He don't know what else to do. Right. He couldn't retire, you know, so every morning he gets up, feeds his horses, talks to his dog, you know, goes and feeds some cattle and, and that's his day. <laughs> and so, I mean, you just, you're really tied to this, this deal. And I'm not sure how, how it works that way, but, it, but you really are, you know, there's, I don't think you could get away if you wanted to. <laughs> you might for a short time. But in then, your blood. But then home would start calling your name again and you'd, you'd come roaring back here. Mm -hmm.